Hello everyone, I hope you're doing well. Today we're going to look at how to reset the user's password through a nice password recovery flow. So as you may have noticed before the intro, we have a page with two forms on it. This page is called resetpassword.php. We have our CSRF token and then two forms. One where the user can enter their email. When they click the button, it's going to call password reset request. And then we have another form where they can enter their new password and then confirm it. And when they click the button, it's going to call change password. In our JavaScript, you can see we have both of these functions and we're going to use the request function from a previous episode to send an Ajax request to a PHP script. Keep in mind, we're also sending that CSRF token along with our request and we will also validate it in our PHP function. So we'll just call request. We're going to pass in the name of our PHP file, which is going to be password reset request. And then we'll pass in the ID, or rather the query selector of our form that's on the page, which is going to be reset password form. The last parameter is a callback, which will take all of the data that we get from our request and give it to our JavaScript function here. And that variable we'll just call data and we'll console.log that to the console. Now we're going to do the exact same thing for change password, but we're going to change the file name and also the ID of the form to match what they should be. So in our PHP file, you can see we have a list of things that we need to do. And the first thing we need to do is validate our post variables and the CSRF token. So we're going to make sure that our post email is not empty, and then we're going to check our CSRF token. To check the CSRF token, we're going to be using the validate CSRF token function from a previous video. And all this is going to do is it's going to make sure that the CSRF token is valid and return a Boolean if it is. We'll also go ahead and echo out any errors to the user. So now that we've validated all of our post variables and the CSRF token, we can go ahead and connect to our database and we're going to use our connect function that we made in the first episode, which is basically just going to call the MySQLI connect with our database credentials that we have in the config file. And we can just check if C returned a true value. Otherwise, we'll echo out that we failed to connect to the database. And of course, once we connect, we want to make sure after everything is done, we close the connection. So if we go back to our list, our next step is to select a bunch of information from our database using the email that was sent as a post variable. So let's go over to our database and look at how we're going to do this. So here in our database, we're going to set up a basic select statement to just grab the ID and the name from our users table. We of course want to only do that where the email matches the email that we sent as a post variable. For now, I'm just going to put our user's email in manually. And when we run that, you can see we are selecting the ID and name from our database. If we look at our request table here, you can see I have one example request. Please notice that the type is set to one, which in our application means that this request is a password reset request. The other type that we have is type zero, which I was using for the email validation requests. And if you want to learn more about that, check out the email validation video. Also note that we have a users column here, and this is how we're going to link this table to our users table. The IDs in this column are going to match user IDs. What this allows us to do is create a select statement where we also join to the request table. And we're going to be able to join on the user's ID matching the user column in our request table. We also want to add to our join query here that we want the type to equal one, and that we want the timestamp to be greater than a certain value. And for now, I'm just going to put in zero. And when we run this, you'll notice we have to actually add users.id here because there's an ID column in both tables, and we get the exact same result as before. But now we can go ahead and add a count to our query here so that we are selecting and counting the number of requests. We also have to make sure that we add a group by statement to the very end, and we'll just go ahead and group by users ID. Once we run this, you can see we get one as our count because we have one request. And if I go ahead and change this timestamp here to something like 10, which is also greater than the request in our table, you can see we're no longer counting it. So let's hop back to our PHP here and set up this statement. We're just going to use the SQL select function, passing the connection, and then pasting in our query that we had before. We're going to replace the email with a question mark and the timestamp with a question mark, and we'll fill in these variables in our function here. So the timestamp is going to be a Unix timestamp, which is an integer, and then we pass in the email, which is just coming from our post request. This variable day ago is just going to be the current time minus 24 hours, and to do that, we just do time minus 60 times 60 times 24. The next thing we can do is see if our SQL select statement actually got a result back, 
And if it didn't, instead of returning an error message, what we're gonna do is actually return a success message. Now, the reason for this is because attackers could actually put emails into this form and keep submitting that until they find an email that is an associated with an account in our system. And we don't wanna allow that. So we're gonna make it so that the response is something like an email has been sent to this account if there is an account with that email. That way, an attacker has no idea of knowing if an email was actually sent, and therefore they cannot verify that the email they put into the form is associated with an account in our system. So next, we can go ahead and actually grab the data that we got from our query using fetch associative array, and then just free that result once we're done. The next step here is to check how many requests we have made in the last 24 hours. And to do that, we're just gonna grab our count variable from the user variable we just made. And what we wanna do is we wanna check if this count is less than the maximum allowed attempts per day. And if it is, then we're gonna go ahead and proceed with our function here. Now you'll notice when I copy this in, I actually use the request expiry time, but I went back and fixed this later to use the max password reset per day variable. So if they have exceeded their actual request limit, we can echo something to the user. Next thing to do is actually create our request and insert it into our database. So let's go ahead and start off by creating a code, which is gonna be made up of 16 random bytes, which is basically a 128-bit code. You can up this to 32 if you want 256 bits of a code, but in our case, it's not too big of a deal. Either way, it will be extremely hard to brute force. We're also gonna have a hashed version of that code, which is what we'll enter into the database. So we'll just use password hash to create that hash. Now we're gonna use the SQL insert function from the previous videos to insert something into our database. Keep in mind that this is gonna return the insert ID of that new row that we've added. So first we pass the connection and then we're gonna pass our query, which is simply going to insert into our request table. And the values are just gonna be the user ID, hashed code, timestamp, and then type, which we wanna hard code at one because this is a password reset request, which we have deemed to be a type one request. So we have an integer, a string, and then another integer here. That first integer is gonna be the user's ID that we got from the select statement. So we'll just do user ID. The string is gonna be that code hash that we just generated. And finally, the timestamp is gonna be the current time, which we can just get using the time function. So we can just check if the insert ID is not negative one because that is our error code. That means something went wrong. So we'll go ahead and echo that we failed to create the request, something along those lines. Otherwise, of course, the request was made perfectly fine, and we can go ahead and now go to the next step, which is sending an email with a link to the user. So sending an email is a little bit of a tricky process. I did make a video on this. It is inside of the send a validation email video that is in the series. So go and check that out if you're curious how to send emails with PHP in a nice secure manner. We're gonna call this function here and it's gonna take in a couple of variables like who we're sending it to, the subject and the message and all of that other stuff that we associate with an email. It's also gonna return a Boolean to let us know if everything's sent correctly. And of course, we just wanna send that exact same success message as before if everything went according to plan. So our first variable here is the email of the person we're sending it to. The next is the name of the person we're sending it to, which we grabbed from the database. The next thing is the subject, which we'll just say password request. And then finally the message, which we'll make as a separate variable here just for organization. And all we're gonna send here is a link, but you can send any HTML, make it nice and pretty and unique to your brand. This link is gonna redirect us to the resetpassword.php page, which I have set up in our HT access to take in some get variables. And you can see that code right here in the HT access where we're taking in two parameters, the ID and the hash. Basically that allows us to format our links like this. So we say reset password. Our ID is just gonna be that insert ID that we got back from our insert function. And then we're gonna send the unadulterated code. So not the hashed code, but the actual code itself. And that is okay because this should only be sent to the email of the user whose password we are trying to reset. We wanna make sure that we actually URL encode this, which is a function we made in another video as well. Basically it's base64, but the last two characters, which are not compatible with URLs are replaced with two characters that are compatible. So by doing that, we're making sure that we don't destroy our URL by having those invalid characters. So with that, we can go ahead and go back to our page and see if this actually works. And if we enter in an email here and click the button, I get an email on my account with a link that takes me back to the same page. So now 
has get variables, we also have the ID and the hash. But of course, we don't want to show both forms at the same time. So what we can do is we can set up some PHP so that we're only showing one form at a time. We're going to basically check if the ID and the hash is empty. And if they are empty, we will show the form where you type in the email. Otherwise, we'll show the form that allows you to actually set your new password. You might notice this is a little bit weird syntax here, but it's the easiest way to echo out HTML in PHP. You can actually just close out of the PHP tag and it is going to act sort of like an echo. That way you don't have to type echo and put all of your code in quotes because I like that nice syntax highlighting and everything else that comes along with having it look like HTML instead of just one string in PHP. So as you can see on the page where we have our actual get variable set, we can only see the change password form. Otherwise, we can only see the password recovery form. So now we want to go ahead and actually create the PHP file for resetting the password. But first, we want to make sure that we add the ID and the hash to our form so that we send it as a post variable to our script. So to do that, we're going to create two hidden inputs here that are going to have the name and ID of ID and hash. And this value, of course, we're just going to echo out the get variable that we sent on the link. I'm also using HTML special chars here so that we can avoid any kind of XSS attack. And if you want to learn more about that, check the previous video in this series where I go a little bit more in depth. So now if I show you what's going on here, you can see we have two hidden inputs in our form and are, they are getting filled with five and then our code right here. So just like before, I have a list of things we need to do in our change password function. The very first thing we need to do is validate our post variables and the CSRF token. So first we're gonna check for the ID and the hash, and we're gonna do these all separately this time, kind of like we did in the register video. In fact, we're gonna be stealing some code from the register.php script, namely the password and the confirmed password validation checks here, because we wanna make sure that the password is a strong password, which is something I went over in the registered PHP video. So make sure you check that out if you wanna learn more about how that works. We're gonna keep track of any errors here in an array, so we'll go ahead and add any errors to the array as they occur. So for example, not sending an ID is obviously bad. No hash is bad. And we also have errors for the password not being a strong password, which of course is something like eight characters, letters, uppercase, lowercase, numbers, and symbols. We also want to make sure that our passwords match. So that's another error that we could get as well. So at this point, if we run across any errors, we're actually going to want to just return out of the script. We don't need to progress any further through our code. So we're just going to check here if our count number of errors is zero. If it is, we can continue on. Otherwise, we'll just skip everything and just go ahead and return our errors as a JSON array. So now we want to check the CSRF token. Just like before, we're going to make sure that our post variable is not empty. And then we'll call our validate token function to make sure that it's a valid token. Our next step here is to connect to the database, just like before, calling our connect function and then setting up that exact if else structure to see if we connected successfully. The next step is to get the user and the hash and all the other information from the request table. And we're going to be using that ID that we sent as a post variable to do that. So we're going to set up our SQL select, pass in the connection. In our query here, we're just going to select the user the hash and the timestamp from requests where ID is equal to, and we'll just fill this in with our post variable. We can also limit the query to only one response, which may or may not have a slight performance increase when our database potentially gets large. Then we'll of course just check if we actually get a result back. If we don't get a result back, that means that the ID is not a valid ID and that this request is either invalid or no longer exists. So we'll just send some sort of error message back to the user. So then we can go ahead and fetch our associative array here and then also free the result once we're done. And now we have our request variable, which is basically a nice little array of all of the data that we selected from the database. Our next step is to actually verify that the code is correct. And this is obviously a very important step. We're going to be using the password verify function and we're going to pass in the code that we got as a post variable and also the hash that we got from our database. And we want to make sure that, of course, these match. Now, if you remember, we did actually URL safe encode our post hash here. So we want to make sure that we decode it before we pass it to the password verify. Otherwise, it will pretty much never be correct. So we can go ahead and echo that this is an invalid request if the password verify returns false. 
Otherwise, we can move on to our next step, which is to make sure that this request is still valid because we do want them to expire after a certain amount of time. That amount of time can be adjusted in the config.php variable, which I will show you in a bit. I have the expiry time set to one hour, which is just 60 times 60, but you can change this number to whatever you'd like. What we're gonna do is we're gonna check if the timestamp is greater than or equal to the current time minus the expiry time. And if this returns true, that means that this is being used and the request was sent in the last hour. Otherwise, this request has expired and we don't want to allow them to reset their password. They can go ahead and send a new request and try again. So the very final step is to actually, of course, update the password. And we also want to just remove all of the reset requests while we're at it so that they don't take up space in our database since we no longer need them. So basically all we're going to do is we're going to use password hash on our password, and then we can use the SQL update function to actually update the user's password. So we're going to say update users are setting their password equal to their password where their ID is going to be the user ID. This is of course a string and an integer, and then we just pass in our hash, and then our user ID that we got from the request before. So this is just request user. This function is going to return a boolean if it worked successfully, and then otherwise of course there is some sort of error. And our final step here is just going to be to delete all of the password requests, which we can actually use the SQL update function for, because it's just going to return a boolean whether or not it worked. And in fact, we don't even really care that much if it worked or didn't work, because at this point, if the other SQL update function worked, there's a very low chance that this one is going to fail. And even if it does, it is not the end of the world, because this is just a nice little cleanup thing that we are performing to save database space. So we're deleting all of the requests where the user ID matches our user ID, and we only want to delete type 1 requests because that is our password reset requests. All right, and with that, we have now finished our PHP file. As you can see, we have a request in our database. And if I go ahead and type in a new password and then confirm that password, once I click my button, it says everything worked fine. You can see that now all of our requests are gone and my password has been changed. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through and replace all of these strings with error codes, and then I'm going to go to the JavaScript and actually echo out the correct thing to the user so that they see a nice little error message instead of sending that error message directly from the PHP. The reason for that is for simplicity, so that you're not sending whole strings back and forth. It really doesn't matter, but it's just a style that I like to use. I'm not going to show me doing all of this because it's going to take a while, and it's really not important and easy to do on your own. So if you guys enjoyed this video, please give it a like. Let me know what videos you'd like to see in the future. I hope to keep continuing this series and adding more and more features to our authentication system. Please comment if you have anything to say. And as always, thank you so much for watching. Goodbye.